Let us then not pursue, by force impossible, by leave obtained, unacceptable, though in heaven our state of splendid vassalage, but rather seek our own good for ourselves and from our own, to live ourselves through in this vast recess, free and to none accountable, preferring hard liberty before the easy yoke of servile pomp. If not equal all, yet free, equally free, for orders and degrees jar not with liberty, but well consist. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. These three quotes I just read are all from the radical republican John Milton's epic poem Paradise Lost, written in the wake of Charles II's restoration to the throne in 1660 and reflecting on the eleven-year Commonwealth of England, Scotland and Ireland. The first depicts the ruthless energy of figures such as Oliver Cromwell, who carried the parliamentarians beyond disagreement and into active opposition against the monarchy. When he came to deal with the radical opinions he had stirred up in the new model army, he gave a response similar to the second quotation. He gradually came to realise, however, that he was indeed presiding over an earthly hell, hated by the Scots and particularly the Irish for his brutal conquest, but Cromwell remained convinced that he was on the right side of history. Oliver Cromwell's political beliefs were formed by a combination of his psychological predisposition and the circumstances of his life. He was prone to bouts of depression, then called melancholia, and his irritability often turned minor disagreements into major rows. Cromwell was ruled by passionate rages, and this led to a falling out in his native Huntingdon, where he had to make a public apology and leave his position as a minor gentry to become a tenant farmer in St Ives. He dealt with this misfortune by turning to the god of the Puritans, which influenced his approach to recruiting his personal troops during the first years of the Civil War called Ironsides. The core of the new model army was discipline, and entry into the ranks was preconditioned by godliness and an awareness of what they were fighting for. This was radically egalitarian for the time. Plain men were made captain of horse. It also produced a radical base of support for Cromwell, and at the end of the first civil war, he heard their views at what became known as the Putney Debates. Circumstance intervened to cut short the democratic deliberations when the war reignited after the Covenanters' treachery, but following their defeat, he was faced with a huge moral dilemma about what to do with the captured King Charles I. Parliament was mostly opposed to putting him on trial, but while Cromwell hesitated, Colonel Thomas Pride purged the body of royalists. Cromwell took this as a sign that the new model army was God's agent of history and convened a court to try Charles for treason. He was no democrat and dismissed the rump parliament when his power was secure for the hand-picked parliament of saints. Cromwell initiated a moral crackdown on drunkenness, prostitution, adultery, maypole dancing, alehouses and theatres. He is remembered by the English for banning Christmas and by the Irish for crushing rebellion, killing prisoners of war and cruelty against civilians. Like Cromwell, John Milton was probably radicalised by personal circumstances. He railed against the rigidity of his Cambridge education and came into conflict with the clergy when they complained that his mother's gravestone didn't face the right direction. At the age of 29, he decided to get out of stifling England and travel to Florence in Italy, where he became influenced by the humanist Renaissance culture that had been born there. He met the elderly Galileo who had clashed with the church hierarchy over his defence of the heliocentric model of the solar system. On his return to England, Milton threw himself into the burgeoning pamphlet war. He wrote in defence of free speech against censorship, claiming that books are not absolutely dead things, but do contain a potency of life in them to be as active as the soul whose progeny they are. Nay. They do preserve, as in a vial, the purest efficacy and extraction of that living intellect that bred them. Ironically, he ended up working in Cromwell's government as a censor. 
His title was Secretary for Foreign Tongues, and his chief duty was to translate the English Republic's correspondence into other languages. Following the restoration of the monarchy, Milton had to keep his head down and relied on friends to shelter him because he had gone completely blind. He dictated Paradise Lost, his magnum opus about the story of Adam and Eve, to his family members who copied it down. It stands as one of the greatest works of English literature and is in part a reflection on the Civil War and Cromwell's Commonwealth in view of its ultimate collapse. The Kirk Party of the Covenanters was opposed to the engagement of 1648, among whom was David Leslie, who was a committed Presbyterian commander, unconvinced by the King's proposition. The Marquis of Montrose, by contrast, was a Scottish royalist who fled to Norway after the Parliament's victory in the First English Civil War. When he learned of Charles I's execution, he was determined to avenge the King and landed in Orkney before unsuccessfully attempting to raise the clans in favour of the beheaded King's son, Charles II. Meanwhile, the Covenanters, both the Kirk Party and Engagers, signed an agreement with Charles II which provoked Cromwell to intervene in Scotland at Dunbar. The new model army routed the Scots, and the remaining soldiers attempted to race them back to London, ending in total defeat at the Battle of Worcester in 1651. James VI and I had encouraged the Protestant settlement of Ireland when he became ruler of the Three Kingdoms in 1603. This became known as the Plantations. It was an attempt to integrate Ireland with Scotland and England, but ended up creating a class divide between Anglo-Scottish Protestant landlords and Irish Catholic tenants. There was no cultural assimilation. Each group remained distinct in language, tradition and religion. This meant that when the rebellion of 1641 failed, it turned into a spasm of rage from the dispossessed, which included marching hundreds of naked Protestants into the freezing lake ban to die. Acts such as these, while terrible enough, were exaggerated in propaganda, and Cromwell responded by invading at Drogheda in 1649, killing thousands and exiling Catholic nobles to the hinterlands.